Good afternoon, everybody. Many thanks for joining us for this exciting end of term webinar on the role of litigation friends across a variety of jurisdictions. I think for many of us, it's been a rather strange legal term um, with a lack or absence of our usual face-to-face um, -face court hearing. But if there is a benefit to meeting remotely, it is that we can so many, have so many people dialed in to this webinar. We have, I think, around 350 registered um, guests. Of course, for all of us, it's a great sadness that we won't be meeting for a glass of wine afterwards, but whether we have 350 or thereabouts guests, we wouldn't fit in uh, to chambers. We don't have a room big enough. We, we might, in normal times, have considered using Gerard's living room, but I suspect Mrs. McDermott wouldn't be too keen. It gives all of us at Outer Temple a, a huge uh, pleasure to welcome our keynote speaker, mm -hmm. the Right Honourable Sir Ernest Ryder, the Senior President of Tribunals, and our guest speaker, the official solicitor to the Senior Courts, Sarah Castle. And um, I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of Mr. Justice Friedman, who I'm delighted to say has also joined the webinar. Our speakers from Outer Temple Chambers today are Gerard McDermott QC, William Young, and Katerina Sido. Litigation friends, their roles, duties, appointment, and sometimes where necessary removal, are all essential to the operation of a justice system which operates for all. Without litigation friends, those who lack capacity, who are often marginalized or vulnerable, may well be denied access to justice. The issues could not be more important. In the presentations today, we will hear a little bit about the development of the important jurisdiction over the last 12 years or so. Uh, and we will hear about the firm footing of the role of litigation friends in part 21 of the CPR and in the context of the Court of Protection. But very interestingly, we will hear a bit about the development of common law powers of appointment of litigation friends in the tribunal system, from the employment tribunal to the first year tribunal to the upper tribunal, and even most recently in the parole board. Courts have appointed rules to ensure litigation friends can act and function, because that is, above all else, fundamental to a fair hearing. But if litigation friends can be appointed, how does one regulate them in the absence of a clear system of rules? What powers do they have? What happens in relation to settlement? And what about issues that might arise after judgment? Our five fantastic speakers will today illuminate and explain these issues which are relevant to all solicitors across a wide area of practice. Our keynote speaker is Sir Ernest Ryder. He was called to the bar in 1981 and a mere 16 years later was in silk. And there's something of a clue there. In 2004, Mr. Justice Ryder was appointed to the family division of the High Court, where he presided over many important family law, mental capacity, medical law, and wider welfare cases. Possibly even more significantly, he was appointed to be judge in charge of modernization of family justice, and which led to a publication of reforms which in large measure became the Children and Families Act 2014, which has streamlined the access of justice for many children and families, making a major improvement to their lives. In 2013, he was appointed to Lord Justice of Appeal. And in 2015, he was appointed to be the senior president of tribunals, only the third such judge to hold such a senior role, where he oversees the administration of justice of some 5,500 judicial post holders. His contribution to the wider justice system has been very significant. And this summer he leaves the Royal Courts of Justice behind to take up a new position as the master of beautiful Pembroke College in Oxford. Uh, those of us lawyers are delighted to note he will continue to have a role in the law as a senior associate at the Center for Socio-Legal Studies in the Law Department. It is our immense pleasure to welcome Sir Ernest on one of his last events as Senior President, and I'll hand over to Sir Ernest now. Uh, well, John, uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone, and thank you to Outer Temple Chambers for the opportunity to highlight and talk about one of the aspects of access to justice that can be troubling both to judges and practitioners alike. My perspective this afternoon will inevitably be 
um, on the problem that needs to be solved in the reserved United Kingdom tribunals jurisdictions, including, of course, the separate uh, employment uh, tribunals. It's perhaps worth just highlighting that those jurisdictions number more than 500 different rights of appeal whose procedural protections are themselves very different from each other. From the inquisitorial function of a mental health tribunal through investigative state party jurisdictions such as social security and child support or benefits appeals, regulatory review jurisdictions in the general regulatory chamber, and there are more than 80 um, of them with 16 different, completely different appeal mechanisms just in that chamber alone, to the adversarial jurisdictions of tax, property and employment. The rules relating to the reserve tribunals are essentially the same. <clears throat> so the Tribunals Procedure uh, Committee makes rules that are deliberately coherent, one set being consistent uh, with another, including the appeal rules for the uh, upper tribunal. It's worth saying, though, that the employment rules are made by not by an independent rules committee, but by the Secretary of State uh, for Business and Enterprise. So in other words, Bayes um, is the sole originator um, of the uh, employment rules, albeit that the present set were very ably drafted with the assistance um, of Lord Justice um, Underhill. None of uh, our rules provide for litigation friends. One might speculate that this is because tribunals, uh, as originally intended uh, by Legate, were to be uh, informal. Indeed, I have what amounts to a statutory duty imposed on me personally to keep them um, informal, as well as being innovative, swift, expert, specialist, and so on. Uh, and in that context, more than 60% of all appeals to tribunals, that's, there are more than 250,000 of them a year, so more than 5,000 appeals a week, um, involve unrepresented litigants. So uh, another reason um, for our uh, rules-based uh, system may be that although the upper tribunal is a superior court of record um, in England and Wales, and likewise employment tribunals and the EAT, the first tier tribunals are not. They have the status and character of courts only for the purpose of setting aside and where appropriate substituting for the first decision maker a new decision on which the user can rely. And so the functions um, of the first tier tribunals uh, need to be borne in mind when looking at general principles of access to justice. And so there are interesting questions of principle that can be drawn out of any analysis um, of our procedures as to whether litigation friends are unnecessary or proportionate response uh, to the problem. Not all academics, for example, would agree um, that they are. But what is the problem? As any first instance judge in the tribunals, who's worth their salt, will tell you, it is an essential component of the judiciary's function to afford equal access to justice. And we have mechanisms to operationalize, horrible word for which my apologies, but it's accurate, to operationalize that constitutional principle. We most often would do it by rules and practice directions, or in the tribunals sometimes by practice statements that don't require government uh, permission. But in other respects of that same fun function, we've done what we have done by our case law. Now in that regard, it's worth remembering this. First tier tribunals cannot bind themselves or anyone else other than the parties um, to the appeal. But the upper tribunal and the EAT create binding precedent in the tribunals in like manner to the Court of Appeal. And interestingly, they cannot be overturned by the High Court, save in respect of the supervisory judicial review jurisdiction. So far as we're concerned, 
High Court decisions are, shall we say, only of interest uh, to us. I'll come back to that body of jurisprudence briefly, if I may, in a moment, because it's an important context within which we look at access to justice for vulnerable, incapacitated, uh, and otherwise challenged uh, users. We generically refer to that body of case law as reasonable adjustments to procedure. That is the use of our case management powers in broad principle terms to create a level playing field. Now descending then to some detail, the most recent synopsis of tribunal practice was stated by the Court of Appeal in England and Wales in AM Afghanistan. That's 2017 EWCA Civ 1123, and that will be on the Outer Chambers uh, website um, after what we finished uh, tonight. It's a guidance decision for tribunals, in particular uh, for the first tier and upper tribunal immigration and asylum uh, chambers. It's binding for those two and persuasive uh, for the rest. It concerned the appeal of a young Afghan man, and the appeal was conceded by the Home Secretary. The young man had learning difficulties, sufficient at least to trigger a ground rules hearing, or what would have been a ground rules hearing in other jurisdictions, to identify what would be necessary to provide him with effective access to justice, at least in procedural terms. That did not happen. Uh, and expert evidence about him and his vulnerabilities and country guidance, or rather expert evidence about uh, country guidance that related to him and his country of origin was ignored at both the first tier and upper tribunal uh, levels, hence the appeal uh, to the Court of Appeal. The judgment of the Court of Appeal came about in an unusual way. I think it's fair to say the Home Secretary would have been perfectly happy for the appeal to go away. Um, and I wasn't prepared to let that happen. I think there were three attempts uh, to concede on any basis possible the facts of the case. <clears throat> um, but unusually during uh, Court of Appeal case management, uh, I was able to give directions uh, and raise procedural fairness as an issue that needed to be resolved. And in particular, how a litigation friend for a child or young person, or for that matter, any other incapacitated person <clears throat> might be pursued before us. Because there was no answer um, in the papers, and no answer uh, initially uh, in respect of uh, this in skeleton arguments, uh, the Lord Chancellor unusually agreed to be joined. Uh, he joined on the basis that he owns uh, the rules for the purposes of litigation uh, about them uh, and therefore needed to state a position about any potential illegality that might arise from a lacuna. Uh, and very interestingly, the resulting judgment of the Court of Appeal was one with which both Secretary of States uh, agreed. And we asked them to consider the terms of it before we issued it in that context. So it's a very unusual position for three judges of the Court of Appeal to find themselves in, uh, that the end product was agreed, um, not just that we were setting out something uh, as between the different skeleton arguments um, of the parties. Our intention was to ask uh, that the judgment be converted in one way or another into new rules. But that, as you would all be able to observe, has not yet happened. Uh, that, there is nothing insidious about that. That's a commonplace. Rules committees um, can wait a very long time uh, for legal advice and drafting to be undertaken, um, even when the Court of Appeal identifies a lacuna uh, or something that needs uh, to be uh, put in place. The judgment sets out how ordinary case management rules can lead to the same conclusion as a specific rule 
that protects somebody who needs a litigation friend and even where that specific uh, protection um, is missing. That is, it may be necessary, we thought, as an access to justice imperative to undertake the analysis in the individual case that we did in the Court of Appeal for the young man concerned. And it's worth considering what those powers um, are because we believed um, that they are insufficiently used. Um, this isn't necessarily a judgment confined to tribunals where case management um, or front-loaded case management is less common than it is in ordinary civil litigation, perhaps in employment uh, litigation and certainly in family uh, litigation. Uh, but even with that practice in the back of our minds, we identified the fact that this was too, not, not often enough thought through, um, even in those adversarial jurisdictions or investigative jurisdictions where it should be more of a commonplace. And likewise, we turned our attention to the international uh, domestic and domestic expert and country guidance materials on safeguarding the vulnerable, which for the purposes of tribunals, we wanted to make it clear we expected to be known uh, by tribunals, judges um, or panels. And, so, and therefore likewise to be known by our practitioners uh, and specialist users so that those materials can be applied alongside um, basic principles. Exactly the same considerations would relate to any other specialist jurisdiction, the court protection and the family courts being the two most obvious, um, where one can expect a degree of investigatory front-loaded positive involvement by judges saying to parties who may have little interest in doing what the court wants, um, that the court actually would like it to be considered on the facts of a particular case. But the bottom line is that we came to the conclusion that whether a person needed a litigation friend, guardian, intermediary, or other facilitator or assistance, a direction could and should be made under existing rules to lead to that procedural protection. So it's a question that should always be asked by practitioners um, of the court. And there is an interesting question that arose out of that, which you won't see in the judgment. But if you were to ask for a transcript of the hearing uh, that led uh, to the judgments, uh, we specifically asked about who pays um, when there are no rules um, or when the rules are silent about that question. It led, as you might imagine, to a degree of discomfort. Quite a lot of shuffling around as between secretaries of state, not necessarily their representatives, but certainly the secretaries of state. And eventually uh, we obtained um, specific instructions from the Lord Chancellor in his role as Secretary of State for Justice. And he offered this solution. Um, that the default paymaster has to be the Ministry of Justice through HMCTS's core budget in any circumstance where the rules do not provide a solution and, and therefore whether it be legal aid or any other provision that may need to, to be funded is unavailable to the particular user who needs the protection. You won't find that in the judgment so I make it clear because I'm of the view that it's far too rarely um, spoken of in relation to how it is you put the principles of AM Afghanistan into practice in a particular case where rules don't exist. It's clearly a temporary holding uh, position uh, until rules properly uh, provide for a solution, but at least it suffices uh, to allow uh, practitioners and indeed, as is often the case in tribunals, those users who have pro bono um, or interest or, or rights groups only to support them, to actually make a claim in relation to how it is um, this particular step needs to be or can be funded. So if and insofar as we needed to say, 
that the gap in the tribunal rules about these questions uh, should be, feel, be filled, we did so in two ways. One of which I've described, that is from first principles using case management powers, but they can also be filled by a rather separate route that we described, and that is by analogy with the case law relating to other protective steps where, for example, the civil procedure rules can be used by analogy. So we came to the conclusion that the tribunals should take steps to eliminate unfairness by using their residual duty of fairness that all procedural codes must encompass. And, and we specifically took um, old CPR and administrative court jurisprudence as our guideline for that principle, um, even though tribunals, most particularly the first tier tribunal, are, are a statutory creation and that would otherwise have no inherent power to do anything beyond that described in the primary legislation uh, or rules. But we came to the conclusion that in, that in no way should they be encumbered uh, to a greater extent than a civil court would be uh, in creating procedural fairness um, for the parties. But there is a note of caution that ought to be sounded in relation to that rather extensive uh, process that you might derive out of the concept of, uh, of analogous uh, principle. The jurisprudence probably doesn't work the other way around, so I wouldn't go try and get in any, any civil court um, near here, um, as you might get short shrift. When moving from an informal specialist decision-making jurisdiction to an adversarial formal court jurisdiction, for example, the business and property courts, or indeed uh, in the county court, uh, the importation of informal protections is not as likely to work. Indeed, it might not work um, at all. And I'm just thinking, for example, of what you will hear during the course of this afternoon and evening about the duty of the representative in civil proceedings in relation to uh, incapacity and how that is characterised um, and the court's inability in those jurisdictions to interfere unless you have an investigative principle such as exists in the court of protection or the family courts, which allows a degree of overruling um, of what an individual representative will have concluded um, on behalf of their um, vulnerable um, client. And so that, that warning is a very real warning. And I know others this afternoon will talk about those circumstances and absolutely correctly, nothing that we suggested in AM Afghanistan is intended to interfere in the personal responsibilities or indeed the adversarial protections that exist um, in the civil uh, jurisdictions. Even in relation to tribunals, uh, I have to be a little careful about this principle of, an, of using by analogy something that is in CPR or perhaps FPR or the Court of Protection rules where it doesn't exist um, on the face of tribunals rules. And let me give you an example that was brought home to me by David Newberger um, when he was president um, of the Supreme Court. He reminded me that Scotland's courts have no concept of being a superior court or indeed any other uh, court of record. It's an alien English importation which they would reject. And there is no rule um, in the acts of sederant that apply uh, to uh, civil procedure in the Court of Session, or indeed in the Sheriff uh, Courts um, in Scotland, uh, akin to the overriding objective. So you would have real difficulties justifying in Scottish jurisprudence um, anything by analogy to something that didn't um, exist uh, in your own rules. It's therefore far more difficult there to transplant an English concept of fair process um, even where the tribunal is a UK tribunal, because in Scotland, if it is sitting there, appeals on points of law will eventually end up in the court of session, which will be obliged to follow Scottish uh, legal principles. The same applies in Northern Ireland, um, but because Northern Ireland by and large has uh, identical procedural fairness concepts to England and Wales, the, the problem doesn't uh, arise. 
you'll see that sort of problem uh, acutely framed by the Vice President um, of the Court of Appeals Civil Division, um, Lord Justice Underhill, in his short concurring um, judgment um, in AM Afghanistan, which identifies that in Johnson and Edwardian International Hotels Limited, he took the contrary view. So there he said that there is no statutory power in employment tribunals as a statutory party party um, jurisdiction to appoint a litigation friend and one cannot get to that place by any analogous or case management route. I disagreed with him. Um, we had a very civilised discussion uh, about it um, and you will hear from Will Young later this afternoon um, whether my view has been taken up by others uh, brave enough to say, uh, well, what uh, Lord Justice Underhill said in the employment jurisdiction was in context and the law uh, is moving on. I, I very much uh, hope that it is, but I, I won't take from him the benefit of telling you uh, that particular story. But of course, this all takes us back to where I started. Uh, and that is that the principles that we were looking at were part of a context. And the context was reasonable adjustments, jurisprudence. There are many uh, and learned treaties uh, on this um, from Supreme Court judges and others, which I won't trouble you uh, with this afternoon. But for ease of reference, if you don't mind me uh, inviting you to look at material that I've produced, simply because it's handy for me to do so. Um, I was asked to give a speech in 2018 for the European Judicial Training Network that at that stage was really keen to look at the concept of reasonable adjustments to procedure across both common law uh, and codified, codified civilian um, jurisdictions. And they asked the Max Planck Institute in Halle in Germany to set up a conference which I spoke at and the speech is called Diversity and Judgecraft um, the 12th of November 2018 and again that will be on Chambers website um, later. When you see the content of that speech you'll see what I did was to cross-reference the various different kinds um, of uh, reasonable adjustments to procedure that already commonly existed um, across the common law jurisdictions of the United Kingdom and for example, the quite powerful statement of approval given to that developing jurisprudence by the Court of Appeal um, in Northern Ireland. It, my view um, is that that jurisprudence is significant, is becoming more extensive uh, and has to do so. It, more than anything else, highlights an obligation on the individual court or tribunal to take measures uh, measures that include ground rules, case management, hearings, to create effective access to justice. Um, it doesn't require government to consent to rules or to provide funding um, to establish the seminal and important role of the judge um, in granting effective access to justice. And where it otherwise doesn't exist, then the judge has to be brave enough to think it through for him or herself. That's the peg on which um, I would like to launch uh, your thoughts and discussions tonight. It's a very important peg, albeit that these are relatively narrow procedural um, questions. If I can invite you, uh, as I wander off into retirement myself, where I might be a little freer uh, to comment on some of the judgments of my colleagues and I have been to date, um, be bold, but be careful in the sense that you want technical procedural protections that endure. So you want to develop them from first principles um, in a way that can be used in other cases and by other practitioners. And that's what this conference is all about. So good luck to you all. And thank you for letting me introduce the evening. Thank you, John. Judge, thank you very much for that fascinating talk. Um, extremely interesting. I'm going to abuse my role as chair and ask one question before handing over to Sarah. Um, you are the first senior president with a background in family law, more than a background. The first two senior presidents had a planning or public law background. Yeah. What experience of 
dealing with very difficult um, courtroom dynamics in the family courts. That, has that impacted your boldness as an appellate judge dealing with some of these very difficult issues? The simple answer is yes. Um, there are occasions in which I'm sure some of my colleagues on the bench would say the result is a rather acerbic uh, series of comments uh, about what they have or haven't done um, because I, I come from a very strong tradition that they inevitably um, in family and public law where I am looking for proactive steps to be taken uh, by judges and practitioners alike and particularly those who are representing um, either the incapacitated or those who are otherwise um, vulnerable. It's, it's a tradition in the family courts you cannot get away from uh, and where you are also in a position that, that knowing whatever each party might think there may be a third line a, a different set of facts that nobody is advocating for because it's a child or young person who's not able to articulate that or a development in the law, however incremental or a procedural protection, however missing, that you suddenly realize needs to be there for the longer term. So how do you start that process in entirely appropriate common law terms to get a jurisdiction there? And I discovered um, without criticism, I have to say, uh, tribunals who in their modern form have only existed since 2010, when they started to come together after the TCEA um, had been promulgated by Parliament, um, at a very early stage of developing um, an identity and a courage and a confidence to do that. And I wish them well in this in the future, because I think their courage and confidence has developed enormously over the last five years. Um, and it's all to do with status, confidence and recognition. And those of you who know what I've been talking about in um, structural terms, that is what judges who are heads of jurisdiction must do with their colleagues to make jurisdiction stronger, more careful, better in terms of their outcomes, will realise that the status of what we do had to be raised. And that was part and parcel of the last five years piece of work. Um, I'm pleased to say that we leave um, lockdown having stayed open for business. Not everybody did that. We've been doing 3,000 cases a week during lockdown. And we've done them by any means we possibly could because we didn't think our users should wait. So the answer to your question is yes, for a whole host of what I hope are good reasons. Thank you, Judge. Absolutely fascinating and a real tribute to your senior leadership role that so many remote hearings are taking place. Extraordinary. Um, we will now hand over to Sarah Castle, the official solicitor. Can I remind everybody you can ask questions in the Q&A box. <coughs> After Sarah has spoken, we will pause for three or four minutes to deal with a couple of questions to Sir Ernest or to Sarah, and then we'll continue after that with Gerard McDermott QC. Um, many of you, of course, will know Sarah, and she was appointed to the extremely demanding role of official solicitor and public trustee in July 2019. So happy one year anniversary, Sarah, and congratulations yes. for everything you achieved in your first year. Very importantly, she is the first woman to hold this statutory post of official solicitor. Um, she took her articles in at Kent County Council and has worked for a series of uh, local authorities, practicing primarily in the field of child protection before coming to be official solicitor. I think it's clear in the year in which she has been in charge, she showed, showed a real determination in her role and has really embraced um, an upward <coughs> role for her office and her own personal role. Indeed, she made legal history appearing in person for the very first time as official solicitor in the case of Barnsley Hospital Trust and MSP a few weeks ago. She is litigation friend of last resort for many of the most marginalized citizens in some of the most demanding and sensitive cases, many of which turn on questions of life and death. An extraordinary pleasure to have her with us and we welcome you, Sarah, and over to you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, John. Um, thank you for inviting me to be part of your seminar and it is a real pleasure to be participating. Um, firstly, I would like to wish Sir Ernest the very best in his new role. 
and to say what an enormous contribution he has made to the bar and as a judge. I've always considered him to be an outstanding lawyer of his generation and your new colleagues are fortunate to be working alongside you. Um, thank you, John, for your introduction. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am Sarah Castle, the official solicitor and public trustee. And John, as you say, I've now been in post for just over 12 months. I am very fortunate to lead a government department of 138 members of staff, a mixture of lawyers and case managers. They are a very experienced team and many of our staff have been in OSPT for many years. Um, within civil proceedings, I act as litigation friend of last resort and our services are in high demand. There are certainly no shortage of litigants requiring the assistance of a litigation friend. I thought today that I would share with you some interesting developments and observations over the past few months and particularly over this period of lockdown. We are seeing a significant increase in the number of serious medical treatment cases and this would appear to be unrelated to COVID-19. If I had to provide an explanation for this, I see it as a possible result of the guidance issued to hospital trusts by the Vice President, Mr Justice Hayden, in January of this year. And also possibly, as more routine medical services start to gear up again, this may be a contributing factor. Whatever the reason, we are seeing a real spike in numbers. It would be interesting if we have any participants today from hospital trusts as to whether they confirm that the guidance is indeed having an impact on when they should make an application. Some of you will be aware that in May this year, we commenced an out of hours pilot for the participation of the OS in serious medical treatment cases. I am personally very committed to this initiative and we will review how it has gone at the midpoint in August and more fully in November. If I was in any doubt of the potential value of the OS's involvement in these cases, I need not have waited very long, as during the second weekend of the pilot commencing, I was called upon to be part of the uh, MSP hearing on the Friday evening, and then I represented myself at the hearing the following Monday. For those of you not familiar with the facts, in summary, this was a case involving a 35 year old man who had a history of gastro and abdominal problems. He had been consistently clear that he could not face living with a permanent stoma. He then found himself in a critical situation, having been rushed to hospital in tremendous pain, clearly requiring emergency surgery. The surgeon could not guarantee any procedure would be temporary, but it was possible any stoma fitted could be reversed. And on this basis, he consented to the operation. It was then much worse than the surgeon feared and in the end, he ended up with a permanent stoma. At the point the matter was referred to the Court of Protection out of hours on the Friday evening, P was in an induced coma and a permanent stoma had been unavoidable. The application from the Trust was whether they should continue to provide ITU support or withdraw treatment other than palliative care. This case was all about P's autonomy, made all the more difficult as he was a young man who could have lived, albeit not in a state he was prepared to contemplate or tolerate. In my view, the evidence about P's wishes were compelling. 
and his wishes and feelings should be weighed most heavily in the balance, and indeed, as Mr Justice Hayden said, determinative. The presumption in favour of preserving life was rebutted by the weight to be afforded to P's autonomy. There are some cases that stay with you throughout your career, and for me, this will be one of them. I had the privilege to hear the evidence of the parents on the Friday evening and again on the Monday. It was cogent, powerful and humble, assisted in my view by the skill and compassion of Mr Justice Hayden. It must be right that the OS is part of the process at the most critical point in P's life and it would have been regrettable indeed wrong, not to have been involved in the out of hours hearing on the Friday evening and not to have heard the crucial evidence. This case also highlighted a couple of further points. Firstly, the process had not been hampered by it being heard remotely. And secondly, I believe some of the evidence may have been better as a result of the remote model. Namely, the medics giving evidence, sitting in their hospital room in their scrubs. This facilitated a more relaxed and, in turn, better quality evidence. I have heard medics say that they find the court process intimidating. Being able to give evidence in their natural environment may actually assist the process and may be something which will continue post the pandemic. If we are looking for lessons learnt and practice to take forward, this may be one of them. The challenge of the remote hearing has been something which has exercised me on behalf of P and their family members. It is an issue which we have addressed as an office in responses to both the family and civil consultations. There is huge potential for P and family members to feel disconnect, disconnected from the process during remote hearings and the opportunities to make adjustments within the court setting are lost or reduced. Having said this, I did witness the very real participation of P from his hospital bed in the recent case of ReWA, which was a masterclass in how to engage P and the family from across the team's platform. As a way to try and assist lay parties, I have collaborated with Alex Rutkeen by contributing to the drafting of a basic guide to the court of protection. It is meant to demystify what P or a family member can expect from the court of protection hearing and explain some of the legal language. Hopefully, this will be found to be a helpful document. So what else has the OS been up to? I had an interesting experience in the, in the administrative court earlier this year when John represented me in JR proceedings concerning a prisoner who lacked capacity to take part in the parole board process and whether the current rules could be interpreted to allow for the OS to be appointed as litigation friend of last resort. I said no. The Law Society intervened and said no. However, to cut a very long story short, the court said yes. I am now acting as litigation friend for this prisoner and I anticipate that this will become a growing area of work in the representation of prisoners in these circumstances. Finally, um, I'm aware that there is a lot of speculation about what my response will be to the Court of Appeal decision in the JB case. I can tell you that I am seeking permission to appeal to the Supreme Court. I do not know if I have been successful, however, the application has been lodged. This issue is of such public policy significance that I felt it was right to ask the Supreme Court to settle the position. Maybe at a future seminar in Outer Temple Chambers, we will examine what happened in the case of JB in the Supreme Court. I sincerely hope we will be in a position to do that.
Eric, thank you so much for those interesting insights um, from your office. Can I ask you one question in terms of out of hours um, litigation trend assistance? It seems to me in many of the cases that I've seen that if you like, to some extent go wrong, they go wrong because the patient cannot be represented at very urgent hearings late at night or over the weekend. I remember being involved in one hearing where we finished at half past one in the morning and uh, Mrs. in front of Mrs. Justice Hogg. We couldn't even get out of the RFCJ, it was so late. <laughs> Your involvement in representing these people is, is crucial. Um, do you expect there to be quite a large number of cases? Uh, and how challenging is it for the team to deal with this on their evenings and weekends? Yes, I mean, certainly the uh, lawyers in the healthcare and welfare team who deal with this work are absolutely inundated with work at the moment. And there are a, a small number of volunteers from that cohort of lawyers who have volunteered to be part of this pilot. And I have to say, I'm very grateful to them. And it's going very well. Um, there are, as to date, there's not a large um, number of cases. Um, but those um, times when we've been called upon, I do believe we have made a valuable and appreciated contribution yes. to the process. Um, as I said just now in my uh, brief talk, I am very committed to providing this service. I think it's absolutely right that we are in the mix at what is a very crucial time in P's life. And I know it's being well received by the High Court bench. Yes, in, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, sir. A couple of questions have come in. Thank you all very much. Sarah, a question for you and from Matt Jackson, which essentially is, what is the OS, what is your position on the power to investigate and or act in employment tribunal cases? <laughs> well, I think, um, I'm, I'm quite open to it, to, to be honest. It, I know it's been an ongoing discussion for many years. It pre, predates me, I think, by um, a long stretch. Um, so I'm open to the possibility. Um, it's obviously um, a, a, a very serious conversation in terms of resourcing the office. It would be a large undertaking. But in principle, I'm open to explore the possibility. Very interesting. We have another very interesting question from an anonymous attendee about forced marriage cases, but I think we might circle back to that um, because it might require just a, a little bit of consideration. Um, Sir Ernest has to leave us at 5.45, so if there's any other questions for the senior president, uh, do please let us have them before then. Um, we now turn away from our two very distinguished uh, guest speakers to our in-house team. Uh, and I'm not going to individually introduce Jared McDermott QC, who, who really doesn't need much of an introduction, nor will Young nor Katerina Sido. But we will hear from the three of them for about 10 minutes each in that order. They have some very helpful slides, which will be shared with you all afterwards. So without any further delay, Gerard, over to you. Yes. Um, and, and, and thank you, John, for the introductions. And thank you, of course, to Sir Ernest and Sarah for agreeing to do this with us. Um, Will and Katerina are going to talk about some of the more detailed procedural aspects, both in tribunals elsewhere, about litigation friends. I wanted to just deal with some of the practical difficulties that you will sometimes come across. Um, I have been involved in catastrophic injury work alongside other work, including employment, for, for 30 years. Uh, and interestingly, you asked uh, Sir Ernest whether he thought his background in family law brought something else to this. And actually, for 12 or 13 years, I probably did quite a lot of family law as well, in fact, often alongside uh, Sir Ernest. And I think that's important because particularly in dealing with wardship, as it then was, and dealing with children taken into care and so on, you saw some of the most vulnerable people at some of the most vulnerable times. Since then, of course, acting very often in uh, serious cases of brain cases of serious brain injury, uh, ordinarily for claimants, the question of capacity is often at the forefront of my mind. 
And I wanted to give you a, a bit of practical advice about what to do in some circumstances where the issues may become more complex. As you've observed, this is an area in which the law is, of course, developed and there's much more guidance than 20 years ago. And, and I, I absolutely welcome the, the widened scope of the court of protection uh, and everything that it's done in this and other areas. Uh, so there's more scope. And it, I think there's still some way to go. There is remarkably little formality about the appointment of a litigation friend without order. Katerina, I think, will have something to say about that. Um, I've had a case in the last couple of years where it wasn't plain to me that anyone had really considered who should be the litigation friend before they came to me. Uh, it may be very often comparatively straightforward for a minor, perhaps the victim of birth hypoxia, uh, who is living with his or her parents and there's no issue. Uh, and very often there may not be an issue in the case of adults, where there is someone obvious who is going to take the lead. Um, but of course, uh, as others have said, the very act of appointing a litigation friend removes some of the personal autonomy everyone's entitled to expect. It means that decisions are made for the claimant. Uh, and in cases where they have retained intellect, perhaps after an acquired brain injury, and their issues are around executive problems and so on, that may bring its own tension. It, it may not be uh, as uh, drastic or perceived by the individual claimant as being as drastic as an appointment of a deputy by the Court of Protection. And I have any number of cases where claimants are really resistant to the loss of their control that they see uh, of a deputy being appointed to manage their affairs. Generally, I've found that they're happier uh, for a litigation friend, and very often, again, if they can follow things, not enough to have capacity, then they can also be involved. Um, so that's very, it's very interesting, actually, that there isn't more required around it. Uh, and the issue becomes more stark when you realise that you might have to appoint a fresh litigation friend. Um, a deputy as litigation friend may be reasonably straightforward. It's uh, almost always within the, the inherent power that they granted. But for instance, um, and these are drawing on particular examples, if there's no deputy uh, and the individual is a minor, uh, well, whether or not a minor, actually, but let's take a minor, and mum and dad are separated, who should be the litigation friend? Who retains solicitors, for that matter? On occasions, I've had to uh, observe to individual solicitors that they may need to be clear that their retainer is a good one. Um, in terms of appointing a litigation friend, I say there's remarkable little formality, as everyone knows, it's covered by CPR 21.4, a certificate of suitability, and no adverse interest and an undertaking to pay costs, and it's largely dealt with. But what happens, as has happened in a case not so long ago to me, when it's quite plain the litigation friend is making decisions or will be making decisions that are quite inconsistent with their position and the best interests of the individual claimant. And of course, for many, it can actually be just too difficult. Uh, the Again, I'm thinking particularly of parents whose children are injured in road accidents, but not just parents, partners, siblings, friends. In addition to having to cope with the dreadful disabilities that the accident has given rise to, they're thrown into this area and this uh, concept that they know nothing about, solicitors, litigation, coming to the temple for conferences and so on. Sometimes it is just the situation that you have to take a view. And, and for my part, I think as leading counsel in some of these cases, I take the lead in it. If I think there is a real issue, then we need to consider uh, making an application to the court to change the litigation friend. It, it might be simple. And if it's reasonably simple, you can use 21.6. Um, <clears throat> if it's not so simple, you can use 21.7. And I have been instructed in at least one case where uh, the parents had separated after the child uh, had been injured. 
uh, and where there was great determination on both their parts to do the best, of course, but there couldn't be agreement. And, and at one stage, Dad went to get new solicitors and he was the litigation friend. And we ended up with a contested hearing. And sometimes that will be a, a necessary uh, situation. Coming back to the question of who should be litigation friends. Well, again, typically in the uh, accident cases that I have, the road traffic accident, very often, who should it be? Well, very often a, another family member. Uh, a solicitor used to be quite common for a solicitor in the claimant's firm, or the, in fact the litigation solicitor do it. I think that's less common now. Uh, where there is a deputy, I think it's far preferable to have the deputy act as litigation friend. And in one case, that's exactly what I suggested, where I thought there was difficulty in, um, in leaving the current litigation friend in place. Um, of course, the official sister uh, in civil litigation, as in other litigation, uh, can be a litigation friend of last resort. My perception is that that happens much less in personal injury cases than perhaps 10 or 15 years ago, uh, uh, but it is uh, an option. Um, I wanted, if I just got a couple of minutes, just to talk about a slightly related area, not so much litigation friend of itself, but what happens if you get caught up in a case where there are issues more than just the personal injury action? Maybe the claimant um, is in such a position that he's simply not in a position to make or to communicate decisions about where he should live. Maybe he or she will be institutionalized and that institution may be failing. Um, you may end up on occasions with situations where the litigation friend decides that in addition to being a litigation friend in the civil litigation, he wants to try and do something or she wants to do, try and do something about the situation, the immediate situation while the litigation goes on, about where their son, daughter, partner is living. And so I have been involved in one recent case of substance where I found myself in a situation where I was running the civil litigation and the litigation friend who was the same in both positions was running code of protection proceedings with different counsel, a different sister, uh, and they were dealing with the situation principally of, of, in fact, where he should live, which was absolutely underpinned the civil litigation case too. Um, and I learned about it. I, I learned that actually the restrictions on what I could be told as the litigation advocate surprised me really we persuaded the court protection to be a bit more liberal. Um, and I felt that liaison was absolutely essential. And we had that, of course. Uh, the question, of course, is very often the same. The, the court protection in that case needed to decide where he is going to live. The litigation team can help with that because we may be able to get funding from interim payments to deal with it. But the question is also central to the proceedings of the Queen Bench. Where is he going to live? Or where is she going to live? The one thing I came away with, uh, and I don't know whether there's any opportunity for uh, Sir Ernest to comment on this, is that I just wonder whether there isn't more uh, possibilities or whether there shouldn't be more possibilities and a readiness for judges in cases of that kind to sit across the jurisdictions. I can see the reason for them being separate, but equally, in that case, I really would have liked to see the two run along one side. That's a little bit of a departure from litigation friends and it's court of protection. And you know, although it's not the central area of my practice, I've been very willing to learn and have learned a lot about court protection from practitioners like you and Chambers who deal with it. And one final topic, which might be of interest. Uh, one of the issues that you've got to do with someone his, uh, who doesn't have capacity is you have to have any settlement approved. But one question that often occurs is, what do you do where capacity isn't clear? Do you have to have capacity determined? If so, do you have to have it determined in the court of protection? Or if it's really a belt and braces, if you're fairly sure the individual has got capacity, can you, as a claimant, or can the insurer invite you because they want a good discharge, go and get approval anyway? The answer is yes, and I've done it in several cases. In the course of preparing for this, my attention was drawn by an unknown correspondent to a case that actually underpins it. Uh, and it's a decision of Mr. Justice Tia. Uh, my slides aren't on there yet. I'll do a few slides to add these in. It's a decision called Coles and Perfect 
it's Mr Justice Tier 2013, if the defendant wants a valid discharge and the claimant's advisors want to be sure they acted appropriately, the court has an inherent jurisdiction to approve the settlement. Now, in a sense, that might have been obvious. But as I say, I'd never had to go and look for the authority until very recently. Uh, and I know that Sir Ernest uh, Ryder, of course, is, is very much a fan of inherent jurisdiction, as should every judge be. And I hope those are useful comments. Uh, if there are any questions, I'll answer them as we go along. Gerard, thank you so much. A very interesting concept, the idea that the appointment of the litigation friend is, of course, a removal of autonomy for one of the parties to the proceedings, and, and caution is required in the process of appointing a litigation friend. So Ernest has turned his camera back on, and of course, we'd love to hear any reflections. He's indeed invited to, I think, comment by Gerard, uh, and I know he has to go in 10 minutes. So, Sir Ernest, back over to you. Perhaps it will be my last comment, given that I don't want to take anybody else's time. Um, but Gerard's concluding remarks are apposite. Cross-jurisdictional work in the High Court, um, which can include, um, for example, upper tribunal judges um, and uh, court of protection judges, involves the heads of those jurisdictions, the vice president, as far as the court of protection is concerned, allocating or giving permission for a judge to sit cross-jurisdiction. So that double or triple hatting process is becoming much more common. Look at my property tribunal sitting in the High Court and the County Court to deal with all um, leasehold matters um, at the same time, instead of going once, twice or three times to a different place for a remedy. Um, I go back to a case which is known as the boy in the blue padded room, a severely autistic um, young man for whom we, we raised family division proceedings, court protection proceedings, administrative court judicial review, and event with the mental health tribunal. You know. Um, don't let anybody say a little bit of bold invention can't get you somewhere. Uh, that young man, um, for a little while, um, not only survived, but did well because of the intervention um, of lawyers. I wish I could say that for him later in his life, but certainly for the time we were involved, the cross-jurisdictional um, working worked well. Thank, thank you very much, Judge. It reminds me of a case, indeed, where Mr Justice Hayden um, resolved the case by deciding he could sit as a judge of the section, he could sit as the judge in the first year tribunal mental health, and indeed he could sit as a county court judge to deal with an application to displace the nearest relative. When I, yes. when I suggested that might be a demotion, he, he brushed that away immediately and in the interests of dealing with the case. And um, Sir Ernest, thank you so much for joining us, and, and thank you so much for the contribution you've made to the law uh, in your judicial and appellate court roles. Um, we very much appreciate you taking the time at the end of term, and we wish you on behalf of all the outer chambers, all the participants of this seminar, and the wider legal community, the best of, of good luck in your new role at Pembroke College. Thank you. Very kind of you. Thank you all. Have a good evening. Thank you. Right, we move on um, to hear um, straight away from Will Young and then Katarina, who will speak for 10 minutes each, and that will allow us five minutes of questions before we end at six. So, Will, over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, and thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm going to talk for a little bit about um, litigation friends in the tribunals, in particular the employment tribunal, and essentially the theme of my talk is going to be where are we now and how did we get there? Um, <clears throat> I've got some slides which I'm going to attempt to show on the screen, so you can hopefully follow what I'm saying. Um, <clears throat> The, the first thing to say is that obviously there are no express powers in the employment tribunal rules or indeed the other tribunal rules to appoint litigation friends. And for some time it was thought that, that no such power could be implied into the rules and in particular see the judgment of Mr Justice Underhill as he was then in Johnson and Edwardian Hotels in 2008. Um, <clears throat> the basis for his conclusion that the employment tribunal could not appoint a litigation friend was that the role of a litigation friend gives them very wide authority to dispose of a party's legal rights and this was not something that could be brought within the general power to manage proceedings and that it would have to be created expressly and by statute if the tribunal was to have that power um, <clears throat> so that was the position in 2008 subsequently for employment lawyers, there had been some indications to the contrary in other jurisdictions. Uh, for example, the case of um, ex parte C in 2016 in the High Court, which was an, an immigration case in which 
Mr. Justice Pickin decided that the first tier tribunal, in fact, did have the power to appoint a litigation friend on the basis that the common law concept of procedural fairness demands that a party uh, have a litigation friend appointed when they can't take part in the litigation themselves. And Mr. Justice Pickin distinguished Johnson on the basis that the rules being applied in that case were different, but he also doubted its correctness in the, in the first place. <clears throat> um, that case was followed by the case of AM Afghanistan, which Sir Ernest has referred to earlier, and he gave the leading judgment in that case. And uh, in that judgment said that there is ample flexibility in the, in the first tier tribunal rules to permit a tribunal to appoint a litigation friend. If otherwise, the party will not be able to represent him or herself and obtain um, effective access to justice. And I think it's, 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 uh, notable that it was also said that even if the expressed terms of the tribunal rules were not broad enough to confer that power, then the overriding objective in the context of natural justice required the same conclusion to be uh, reached. And there was also reference to the case of Wiseman and Bornman, um, uh, uh, which is from 1971, um, in which it was said that, and I quote, uh, where a statutory tribunal has been set up to decide final questions affecting parties' rights and duties, then if the statute is silent on the question, the courts will imply into the statutory provision a rule that the principles of natural justice should be applied. And so um, the reasoning there was applied to the litigation friend question. Uh, it's also of note that in Lord Justice Underhill's um, concurring judgment, he, and, and this is of particular relevance to employment um, tribunal practitioners, he doubted the correctness of what he had previously said in the Johnson case in 2008, um, which uh, I think pretty strongly left the door ajar to the same, same or similar arguments being run in the employment tribunal. Uh, he also had some very interesting things to say about the procedure for appointing litigation friends, but I'll come back to them in a moment. The AM case was followed in 2017 by the case of Duty and Royal Mail, uh, which was a decision of the EAT made by um, uh, Mr. Justice Simler, as she then was, which decided that the Employment Tribunal did in fact have the power to appoint litigation friends under the Rule 29 general case management powers and by analogy with the CPR rules. <coughs> um, the some guidance was given uh, in the case of duty as to the principles to be applied and it's paragraph 39 of the judgment essentially the three principles that were stated there are that firstly a person is assumed to have capacity unless otherwise shown secondly no one can act as a litigation friend unless they can fairly and competently conduct proceedings on behalf of the party. And then thirdly, an application to appoint a litigation friend must be supported by evidence both of the suitability of the person to be litigation friend and also of the basis for the litigation friend's belief that the person that the party lacks capacity. Um, that guidance obviously helpful so far as it goes, but there's no detailed guidance in the judgment as to the procedure um, to be adopted for appointing a litigation friend. And uh, there have been no amendments to the employment tribunal rules as yet to reflect um, this development. <clears throat> and uh, at this point, I think it's relevant to come back to Lord Justice Underhill's comments in the AM case, because what he says, and I've, it's up on the slide there, but what, what he said is that litigation friend, again, repeating his comments from Johnson, has wide authority to dispose of a party's legal rights, uh, either by bringing or compromising proceedings or indirectly by the way in which they, they are conducted. And he then went on to say that those powers ought to be clearly defined and regulated as they are by Rule 21 under the CPR. And it's very unsatisfactory that they should be exercised simply on the basis of general case management powers in the tribunal rules. Um, and he again referred to Sir Ernest's uh, call that uh, the rules be amended to reflect this. Unfortunately, that hasn't happened in the employment tribunal as yet. Uh, so we're, there's still a degree of uncertainty. Um, I'm going to come back to that in a moment, but there have been some other developments since um, uh, duty in other jurisdictions. The EG and parole board case from June of 2020 
uh, made it clear that the parole board does have the power under its 2019 rules to appoint litigation friend on behalf of a prisoner. And again, that's a decision that was reached uh, along similar principles to those that uh, have been spoken of already in relation to the other jurisdictions. I'll just quote very briefly from Mrs. Justice May in that decision where she agreed with the suggestion from counsel in the EG case that having a litigation friend was so fundamental to ensuring a fair hearing uh, for a person who lacks capacity that it would require words which clearly excluded such an appointment before a court could find that it was not provided for which is an interesting contrast if you think back to the reasoning in the Johnson case where Mr Justice Underhill, as he then was, said that because of the wide-ranging powers of litigation friends, uh, there would need to be express powers in the rules for one to be appointed, whereas now in 2020 the position is, is practically the opposite, that um, because uh, access to justice is so fundamental there needs to be there would need to be an ex express exclusion of the power uh, for the court to conclude that uh, there isn't the power to appoint one <laughs> now coming back to the employment tribunals there has been in april 2020 uh, the release of the employment tribunal president's guidance for vulnerable witnesses this touches briefly on the uh, litigation friend issue, although it doesn't offer any specific guidance as to uh, the process and procedure. But there is also some useful broad guidance for uh, cases involving vulnerable witnesses, which may or indeed probably likely to be relevant in many cases involving litigation friends. I'd just like to finish by um, sharing a little bit of personal experience post duty as to um, the issue of litigation friends and, and how it's approached in the context of employment tribunal litigation and just to mention the case of AB and RBS which was in the employment tribunal um, the judgment coming out in February of this year and there are potentially two relevant points from that case that touch on the litigation friend issue the first is the point of substance in the decision in AB um, which is that the conclusion of the EAT that the employment tribunal has the power to stay proceedings for an assessment of capacity to be carried out and indeed that the employment tribunal should do so where there are genuine and significant concerns about the party's capacity. Um, <clears throat> the second point is something that doesn't appear in the substantive judgment in um, the AB case because it took place prior to the actual hearing but in that case in the run-up to the EAT hearing, there was an application made by the claimant um, for the appointment of a litigation friend, and the respondent um, <clears throat> opposed that application, arguing that because capacity was itself an issue in the substantive appeal, there should be a contested hearing on the question of capacity and whether a litigation friend should be appointed. And his Honour Judge Auerbach, who decided the matter prior to the substantive EAT hearing, decided that by analogy with the CPR, um, the appointment of a litigation friend was essentially a procedural matter in which the respondent would not normally have any arguable interest and could not be prejudiced, <clears throat> um, which, which suggests, I think, that save perhaps where there are direct consequences in which the other party does have an interest, for example, the costs of deputyship, then in general, the question of appointment of litigation friend is or ought to be a straightforward uh, procedural or administrative one and that the rules of the CPR will be applied by analogy. <clears throat> it's difficult to say at this stage whether the employment tribunals um, will generally follow that. I've got one case ongoing at the moment in which the claimant uh, has lacked, uh, has lost capacity during the course of the proceedings and an application has been made to the employment tribunal to appoint a litigation friend um, using, uh, sticking very closely to the forms and procedures of the CPR. Don't know what the outcome of that is as yet, but our hope and assumption is that the employment tribunals will follow the, uh, the procedure in, in, in the CPR. So I think the position um, as to where we are now is that in the Employment Tribunal and, and the EAT as well, the position seems to be that there, there is a power to appoint a litigation friend if required and if appropriate. There is a degree of lack of clarity about the procedure. Uh, for now, it seems that the CPR procedures uh, apply at least to a certain extent by analogy, but we expect and hope that there will be new rules in due course to address this, because I think there are still some significant unanswered questions without the rules. For example, um, <clears throat> does the Employment Tribunal have the power to approve a compromise? And I think it's not 
totally clear what the answer to that is. I think the EAT as a superior court of record would do. I think it's less clear uh, what the position would be in the ET, although the answer may be the case that Gerard referred to, the Colson Perfect case. It may be that parties would have to go to the civil courts to get that approved. But those are the kind of things that are, at the moment, I think, unanswered until we have um, rules or at least firm guidance for how it works uh, in practice. Well, Fernandez, thank you for covering so much case law in such a short period of time. Can I remind anyone to um, use the Q&A to ask any further questions? <laughs> any of our speakers and we'll now hand over to Katerina who will speak about what some other jurisdictions may learn from the Court of Protection and update us on a recent Chancery decision which I think is very interesting. Uh, bear with us, you've uh, enjoyed four speakers, one to go, I know it's approaching six o'clock but we will find a little bit of time for questions after Katerina. Thank you all, Katerina. Thank you John. Um, I'm going to address in the time remaining to us a couple of areas where I think that there are lessons that civil practitioners can learn um, from the Court of Protection. And I'm going to start with um, when your client needs a litigation friend, so the capacity to conduct proceedings. Um, the civil procedure rules tell us that we should be looking to the Mental Capacity Act 2005 to determine when somebody lacks capacity to conduct proceedings and therefore needs a litigation friend. And that's what brings us to the Court of Protection. Um, the Court of Protection was, of course, created by the Mental Capacity Act. It is the court with jurisdiction to consider issues um, arising under that act, um, including questions of capacity. And um, it's the court that most frequently applies and interprets the Mental Capacity Act. And I think most importantly of all, it is a court where in almost every action, there is at least one party who will have a litigation friend. So it is a court that is very experienced in dealing with these issues of capacity um, and litigation friends. And I think there's a lot of assistance to be gained. I've set out on the slide um, that's on the screen at the moment, really where we start um, in the Court of Protection, which is with the Mental Capacity Act itself. Um, and those are the key principles on capacity. The first bullet point is the test for capacity, whether somebody's unable to make a decision for themselves because of an impairment of or a disturbance in the functioning of the mind or brain. The second two, the next two bullets um, set out the presumption in favor of capacity, which can be displaced um, on the balance of probabilities. And it's for the person asserting a lack of capacity to prove it. The fourth bullet point I think is particularly um, important and that's that a lack of capacity can't be established merely by a person's age, appearance, a condition they have, or an aspect of their behaviour. And I think that can be sometimes overlooked um, in civil proceedings, that capacity is not status. It's not a status, it's functional. Um, so it's about what you can and can't do. It's not about what conditions you do or do not have, or, for example, whether you are somebody who has a deputy to make other decisions for you, um, this is about whether you can make the particular decision at issue. So, for example, we can't say, well, this is a person who has dementia, they need a litigation friend. We have to ask, um, does this person's dementia prevent them from making the decisions at issue? Um, how do we apply these principles to capacity to conduct proceedings in particular? Um, well, as I've said, capacity is functional. It's about decision making. And so we have to focus on the particular decisions that are at issue when somebody is conducting proceedings. Um, and it's important to say that it's not conducting proceedings in general, but it's the particular proceedings um, that, that your client is, is contemplated or that are being um, contemplated on behalf of your client. Um, there would be very different decisions required if you were talking about, for example, a straight va straightforward low value um, trip and fall, somebody who uh, trips on the highway and breaks their ankle, very different decisions to a complex high value chancery matter. Um, you have to think about those specific proceedings when you're thinking about whether your client has capacity. Um, as part of that, you might ask, well, do we need to break down each and every decision within proceedings and think about whether the client has capacity in respect of all the steps in proceedings? And the answer um, given by the Court of Appeal in the case of Bailey and Warren was no. Um, you shouldn't assess capacity to 
engage with one aspect of proceedings in isolation. So in that case, it was a decision to accept a settlement offer. And I think you can see the force in that when you think about the interrelatedness of legal proceedings. Even if you're making a decision to accept a settlement offer, that really touches on every aspect of the proceedings, on the merits in general, and on what might happen in the course of proceedings. So you can't really hive off different decisions. Um, it's about the entirety of those specific proceedings that you are dealing with. Um, the courts have set out specifically um, the types of decisions people have to make in litigation, and I've set those out on the slide, um, and the slide can be provided to you later so you can look at that in your own time. I think that the most important thing to highlight is that, um, like any other litigant, we are talking about the individual's capacity to make decision in light of the advice that they may receive from legal representatives and experts. So we aren't requiring the individual to have a level of understanding that rises um, to that of a lawyer, but they do have to be able to understand enough to be able to make a decision on the advice that they've received. And then last of all, a bit of a whistle-stop tour, but how, in practical terms, should you be thinking about um, a client's capacity? I think the key thing here is you don't need a medical report, you don't need a medical assessment. There is nothing that says um, in the rules for civil procedures that a medical, any medical evidence or any expert evidence has to be provided. And I think this is what Gerard mentioned about, it's surprisingly informal. People can self-certify as litigation friends and they will say, I believe that this individual lacks litigation capacity and by and large that is sufficient. From a court of protection perspective, I think what I would urge is that the evidence that you have must be sufficient to displace the presumption in favour of capacity on the balance of probabilities. And what is sufficient is going to depend very much on the facts. So in the, the sort of complex chancery matter we mentioned earlier, if you have a client who's nonverbal, can't read and write, um, you may need very little evidence to persuade you that that person is probably going to be unable to engage with and give instructions on a complex chancery matter that's based on a lot of written documents. Um, however, if that client, and Gerard mentioned as well, has, has, for example, a subtle traumatic brain injury, that's going to be a much more complex assessment. And that's the kind of case where you absolutely need um, a, a medical report. And I think it, it may well be similar in a case uh, where, for example, somebody has the early stages of dementia. Uh, the next topic, and really the final topic I want to address, is uh, how, how should litigation friends behave and who is appropriate to be appointed? And again, this was a topic that Gerard touched on. The position is actually broadly the same in the Court of Protection and in civil proceedings, uh, and, and as Will touched on as well in, in tribunals. Can the individual fairly and competently conduct proceedings and do they have no interests adverse to the protected party? And the interesting point here is, to what extent does that mean that the litigation friend has to be independent? When we talk about interests, does the litigation friend have to be somebody who stands completely aloof from the proceedings and doesn't sort of take, doesn't have a horse in the race? And Mr. Justice Charles, in the case of re-NRA, confirmed, no, family members will have an interest in the outcome of proceedings because they will be really worried about what's going to happen to their family member and they may have very firm views they can still be a litigation friend, um, but they may not be suitable in some situations where there's a real dispute about whether what the family member is doing is in the protected party's best interests, either because there are other members of the family or other people involved with that person's care who have concerns about what that family member is doing, or because the individual themselves objects to the course of action that the proposed litigation friend is taking. And I'll return to that in a moment. Um, this question of best interest is important to the, in the Court of Protection because the Mental Capacity Act says that um, every act done on behalf of someone who lacks capacity should be done in their best interests. And the principles on how, how you understand best interests is um, I've set out on the slides there and I'm going to just sort of skip over them. But in effect, you need to consult with the person. You need to consult with per people who know them well and who are responsible for caring for them. Um, and take into account, as I say, the views of people who either are interested in that person's welfare or who have a specific legal role, like a, a deputy or a, an attorney. Um, what do you do uh, if 
you and your litigation friend disagree. As I said, Mr. Justice Charles indicated in the re-NRA case that um, disagreement between uh, a protected party and a family member might indicate that the family member is not suitable to act as litigation friend for that individual. Um, I think this is a difficult issue and where there is that kind of dispute, it probably is the sort of case that would merit the independent involvement of someone like the official solicitor um, to take a, an overview position um, and ensure that the protected party's rights and autonomy um, are, are protected. However, it's important to note that the state of the law at the moment is that litigation friends are not obliged to act in accordance with the wishes of the protected party. Um, and I've, I've set out on the slide a court of protection case where, um, that bears that principle out where effectively the official solicitor declined to advance the position that the protected party wanted her to. Um, this is the last topic that I want to very quickly whiz through which is a recent case in the Chancery Division of Hinduja and Hinduja, which is a very interesting one. Um, and I think it shows you how the civil courts apply some of these principles. This was a dispute um, between four brothers regarding a business worth uh, over, I think, 10 billion pounds. Daughter of one of the brothers uh, wanted to act as his litigation friend, but she hadn't filed a certificate of suitability um, and the court was being invited to regularize the position, but this was resisted by the other three brothers who said, first, incapacity hasn't been established. And second, even if it is, the daughter's not a suitable litigation friend because she has an independent financial interest in these proceedings. Um, Mrs. Justice Fault was having absolutely none of that. She said, incapacity is established on the balance of probabilities. We don't need any specialist medical evidence in this case. Um, it's appropriate to simply take the view of the proposed litigation friend, um, the protected party's daughter. She lived with him, she cared for him, she had a lot of knowledge of him. She had said that he had deteriorated in health, wasn't able to give instructions to lawyers uh, because of age-related disease, and that was enough. Um, the background was that uh, Mr. Hinduja did have a diagnosis of dementia, but there was nothing specifically said about that, and there was no sort of addressing of the statutory test in his daughter's evidence. Um, she just said he doesn't have capacity and, um, you know, I'm going to do this for him. Um, as to the question of suitability, Mrs. Justice Falk said, it's no problem if a family member has their own interest, as long as that interest is running in the same direction as the protected party's interest. Um, somewhat echoing Mr. Justice Charles's approach in the re-NRA case. Now, I'm just going to close by saying I think that um, there are a few factors that perhaps explain the judgment in this case. And I personally would be very cautious about relying on it as um, evidence of a best practice approach to capacity and the appointment of litigation friends. Um, I think the decision can be explained in part due to the fact that the brothers weren't offering any independent evidence on capacity. They were just criticizing the, the daughter's evidence. There were concerns from the court that this was a tactic to delay the litigation. Um, and uh, I think that uh, th this is also bearing out the comment that was made by Sir Ernest and was just picked up by Will in the last talk, that effectively in adversarial proceedings, the court isn't going to intervene too uh, intrusively in the question of capacity and litigation friends. Um, it is seen, uh, I think, as Sir Ernest said, it's, it's the responsibility of the representatives and not the other side. Um, from my, you know, my, my personal view is that it would be preferable to have a very carefully considered position on capacity and avoid therefore the question of these satellite issues ever arising and even having to trouble the court with them and that's the best position both for the clients and, and for the representatives. Um, and although that was a bit of a whistle stop tour I hope I've given you some uh, guidance today from the Court of Protection on how best to do that. Terrific. Thank you very much, Katerina. Um, can I ask that um, Sarah, Gerard, Will and Katerina all put their cameras back on? Because I have one uh, final question for all of them, and it's really more of a policy question. Um, and if they can answer it very briefly, because it's three minutes past six, it's almost the end of term, and that seems to suggest gin and tonic to me. Um, but my, my question is, we've looked in tonight's seminar over the last hour and a half at personal injury, clinic, 
We've looked at employment, we've looked at first year tribunal immigration, we know there's many other chambers, um, we've looked at the Court of Protection and now we've looked at a Chancery case. Is it right as a matter of policy that the approach to litigation friends should be broadly the same, given these jurisdictions are all substantively and procedurally so different? My answer would be that yes it is. That you can go into any dispute of any kind and the issue about, uh, sorry, let me just start my camera. The issue uh, about capacity will be very similar. And it's about autonomy. It's about protecting that party's interests in particular. And I think it's very helpful to see that all the divisions of the High Court and elsewhere follow the same sort of approach. Thank you, Gerard. Sarah? I can quite see the force of that argument. I think it would allow practitioners to navigate the system in a much better way. Thank you. Will? Um, yeah, I think I would, I would certainly generally agree with that. The only thing I would say, just to touch on one of the questions that was made earlier or, or asked earlier, is that in something like the coroner's jurisdiction, I can see that it might be harder to persuade a coroner that the principles apply in exactly the same way because the coroner is not determining the legal rights and interests of the interested parties. And so I think that some of those policy considerations about access to justice, perhaps, obviously they still apply, but the, the dynamics are perhaps a little different in something like the coroner's jurisdiction. That's very interesting. Some of us might have sort of shared that view broadly when it came to the decisions made by the parole board, which is more an assessment of risk. But, but there we go. Greater minds than I said no. Katerina, any last comment? Uh, no, I mean, I agree entirely. I think that if, if somebody has, if there are proceedings where somebody has standing and, should, and is de defending a legal right, then uh, I think it stands to reason that there should be a regularised law on um, litigation friends but I can also see what Will is saying that where somebody doesn't have standing to defend a particular legal right um, it, it may be overly complicated and, and perhaps not legally sound to have litigation friends involved there. Wonderful and um, thank you all there was a, an outstanding question um, regarding forced marriage cases uh, and I think broadly speaking um, from my experience of having acting in those uh, the answer is that it all depends. It very much depends on the nature of the marriage and the circumstances and when there might have been um, a lack of capacity. And I would have thought that questions of public policy do sometimes influence Sarah's uh, approach to decisions. And, and we may well see more on that if permission is granted in the Supreme Court in the case of JB. I don't know if you want to add anything, Sarah. No, I think that's perfectly answered, John. I, I, I agree. Um, Sarah, a huge thanks to you in particular. Uh, it's your one-year anniversary. Congratulations. We're absolutely delighted you can join us, and it was great to have Sir Ernest. Thank you all watching at home or from your offices. I think we had just 200 people um, online uh, at one stage. As I say, I think 350 had registered. This will be produced as a webinar and sent to you all with slides and, very importantly, the link to Sir Ernest Ryder's speech he gave in, in Germany. Um, can I thank all of our speakers? Um, thank you for so much information. Thank you all for attending. And it's almost the end of term, whether you get to travel to Spain, France, Germany, Greece, my favorite Greece, or further afield, I wish you all a safe and happy summer. And um, thank you all very much for joining us. Take care and have a good evening. And well, Jack. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, John.